Hello and welcome to part four of my mastering help demystification vlog type thing. Um, I'm Joe Kithness, I'm a mastering engineer I'm based in Nottingham in the UK. I'm currently talking to you from my dining room um, because the lighting in my studio isn't quite, um, isn't quite right really for this sort of thing. What I'm going to talk about now is controversial or at least um, people get very stressed out about it. And it really doesn't have to be that way if everybody just calms down. That's my opinion. What I'm talking about is preparing audio for vinyl. What I mean by that is what is correctly termed vinyl pre-mastering. The reason why we say pre-mastering is because the actual master in vinyl is a physical disc. And the reason for that is because it's an analog format. Mostly we would just just call it mastering um, because we understand we're working still in, in digital at this stage. Um, but technically it is called vinyl pre-mastering because the cutting engineer who's cutting the lacquer or the DMM, which we'll come on to later, um, is actually doing the mastering. Now, there's basically three different ways of doing this. There's which I think is probably the most common, is to have a mastering engineer who also does digital formats, like me, to do the vinyl pre-mastering and then have um, somebody else either at the plant or a, a named cutting engineer, who's also a mastering engineer, do the cut. The second way is to have somebody do everything all in-house. That tends to be more expensive just because the overheads are larger, um, but it also tends to give you the most control. So you have somebody who does... Um, the vinyl masters and the digital masters uh, and then they send the lacquer or whatever off to the plant and then the plant do the metal work from that and then the third option which i think is probably best to avoid unless you're on a really really tight budget is to basically just throw your mixes at the pressing plant the pressing plants all do have a, a pre-mastering option but they're not specialists in that. I'm sure there's perfectly, you know, great people who do this, um, but it's not their main focus because usually what they'll be doing is preparing the, the bits and bobs for actually sending to the cutter head, um, which is not quite the same thing, but the, the lines blur often. So I'll explain what I do. If it's a release where it's digital and vinyl, I'll do the digital proof first, which is the digital version with all the loudness processing applied, you know, limiting any harder compression, clipping, that sort of stuff. And that will be signed off by the client. Once that's signed off, I'll make the digital masters and cut those all up and do the metadata and all the good stuff to give you the production masters for the digital. And then I will make a new session. And I think this is the most common way of working from colleagues that I've spoken to and what I've seen on online and stuff. I'll make a new session to export vinyl sides from the audio that's been processed. In the most basic sense, the vinyl pre-masters are just the sides of the record exported in whatever sample rate bit depth is native to the session. Most times that'll be something and then 24 bit, probably 44 or 48 most times. Um, depending on what the, the sort of the market is for the digital, sometimes you'll have a higher a higher sample rate, but we won't go on to that now because that is a controversial topic in in of itself. And then you'll send that off alongside a PQ sheet. Um, PQ sheet is just a track listing. We call it a PQ. That's a hangover from the CD days. Um, but we don't really need to go into why it's called a PQ sheet. Just know that it's the tracks, the sides. And that's information so that the cutting engineer will be able to make sure the tracks are right. You know, simple as that in, in the first instance, make sure you've given them the right info um, and also make sure that they can um, put the, the visual markers on the vinyl uh, where it needs to be. Because, some, you know, it's not always just track, 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 things blend together. They have fades, they have interludes at the start and the end, and the vinyl engineer needs to know where they, the track officially starts. Now, doing this gives you the opportunity to do something which is unbelievably important and is almost 50% of the time, accidentally, 
um, you know, not willfully, ignorantly ignored, and that's the length of the side of the record. Now, as you can see, I've got lots and lots of records. There's lots more over here, and there's lots more upstairs as well. Um, one of the things with the advent of the CD compared to vinyl was the amount that you could fit on one disc. So on CD, you can get 70... I think it's like 73 without it being a problem. You can put more on there, but you, you, some players will struggle. Um, with vinyl, you've got two factors. You've got the length of the audio, and you've got the, um, the speed the record plays back at. So if you're not aware of how vinyl works, consumer vinyl LPs and uh, 7 inches, 10 inches, etc. will usually run at... Uh, 33 and a third RPM, which is the LP length, or 45, which is the EP length. That's the language where that comes from. Um, now, I'm going to get a record to show you an example of this. Uh, okay, this is an LP. This is a classical LP from the early 70s, I think. Yeah, maybe late 60s. Now, this record is a classical record, so the overall levels are very dynamic, and the quiet bits will be quite quiet. And if you look at the record, you can see there's some lines in it, and you see you've got some hair on it. You see you've got this area here, which is blank, and then it has a little line on it, that's called the lead-in. That's where you're, you drop the needle on, then it bounces across until it lands in this. That starts the groove. Then you've got track, track one, two, three, and then you've got a section here which is called the lead out, which you have a little, a little line that picks up from the last bit of the record. You can see a little quiet outro, picks up, and goes round, and then in the middle you have a locked groove. And that locked groove spins round forever, and it just means that your um, needle doesn't jump across the centre of the, the record and scratch the needle because you know, paper's not great for a, a tiny metal stylus or diamond, or whatever your stylus is made out of. Now, when the record is on the further out for outer edges, to get a full revolution is, is longer, because it's a circle. It's, it's, it goes, it's like a spiral, isn't it? It goes more and more in. Now, the closer you get, the more strain there is on the cartridge. Um, for several physical reasons that I won't go into massive detail about because you could probably do a whole lecture on that. But what it means is that the tone of the record changes from the outside to the inside, and there is no way of avoiding this. What you can do in your vinyl pre-mastering or your cutting is maybe make adjustments for that, which I do all the time, because people will want quite a long side and they want a loud, bright track at the end, and sometimes we will have to do some slightly different processing to that. Um, because it's just not going to work on the LP. Now, usually you would do that with experience, or you would do that in collaboration with the cutting engineer, because they will be able to tell you at the end of the day if it's a problem or not. And you should, as a mastering engineer who's doing the vinyl pre-mastering, be able to adjust it for your client, sign the sound off, because it's going to be stuff like sibilance, mostly, and high-frequency stuff, and that could really change the tone of a recording. If you've got massive bashing cymbals at the end of your track here, and you DS it, and it sounds weird compared to the, the chorus of the first track, you might have to resequence the record. So this is why this stuff is so important. There's a couple of different schools of thought about the length of the sides that you can get away with. But generally, generally, an LP can be up to about 45 minutes, depending on the style of music. The louder and more bassy the style of music, the shorter you want the sides. Really rough rule of thumb. I'm not going to go into vinyl cutting, I'm not going to go into any of that stuff or um, get into the weeds with that. There are some podcasts I would uh, personally suggest, uh, Scott Hull's podcast, Making Vinyl at Master Disc, where he goes through all of this stuff an hour at a time, but I'm not going to get into it right now. One issue that you'll get a lot with certain releases is that they'll, they'll originally have been released on CD or a digital format. And then you're moving them over to vinyl, and you'll find that it doesn't fit. So a CD, like I said, is about 73, 74 minutes. That's two LPs. 
Now, you can be clever with that. You can make it two LPs and you can run them at 45 RPM and you can get a really nice loud cut. But that's expensive. It's double the price, pretty much. Um, and you can understand why people don't want to do that. So something you might do in the vinyl pre-mastering stage is actually consider edits. And the vinyl pre-mastering engineer, like myself, will be able to consult you on that. Now, as far as audio processing goes, this is, again, controversial. Now, like I said with the other stuff, you really need to just go to the person who's going to do the next stage. Don't be afraid to ask questions, and don't be afraid to feed that back to the mastering engineer. So, for example, there's a very, very big plant in the Czech Republic called GZ Media, who do lots and lots of stuff that I work on. And they do lots and lots and lots of records. They are massive. They actually do have rule of thumb guidelines for vinyl pre-mastering. So if you're getting your record cut at GZ, grab that PDF, send it to the mastering engineer. And if the mastering engineer argues, that's a red flag. Because we're just facilitating. We might have our own opinions, we might have our own experience, but really all we're doing is getting it from A to B. So usually what you'll find is there are two main issues for the vinyl sound um, not being the way that you want it to be. It's high frequency content, it's usually cymbals, sibilance, which is the S sound of your voice, or any distortions or strange noises caused by either synthesis or uh, limiting, clipping, that kind of stuff, which is intentionally on the record. The other one is something called phase, which, again, you could, I mean, you can do an entire degree pretty much on phase and how phase works. Long story short, if your low end is out of phase, you might have some issues. And what this generally means is that your speakers are pushing and pulling at the same time in different speakers. The reason for that, again, I'm avoiding any technical stuff, there are other people who can explain this better than me who do this every single day, um, is the fact that you've got one needle, one stylus, one cartridge, to represent a stereo signal. And the way that that works is very clever, but one of the limitations of that is to do with the phase at large waveforms, which is bass. By large, I mean long. The good news is that most of the stuff that doesn't sound very good on vinyl doesn't sound very good in general. And this is something that people really miss out. Most times, if there are issues with stereo bass uh, being out of phase, it usually sounds better if I fix that for the digitals because it's usually a mistake. It's usually to do with uh, reverb sends in, in the reverb delayed bass basically. And that usually clears up the low mids in a way that doing loads of weird little notches and cuts and stuff, you know, it's just a simple fix. You do that and then you listen back to the original, you make sure the amount of energy in the bass is still the same. So you make sure you're not losing anything. But top tip, if you go through sections of the song and the, your kick drum changes, um, you know, even though it's a sample or even though it's the same kick drum, but from the chorus to the verse, it sounds different. It's usually to do with the phase relationship, to do with what else is going on there. And sometimes you can't avoid this stuff. But yeah, if your kick drum suddenly sounds weak when you've got stereo guitars in the chorus, have a look at the sub information in the guitars, because it may well be that you're actually fighting against yourself. So yeah, usually doesn't sound great um, in the digitals, can often be considered an error and can be fixed. And then that's also fixed with the vinyl. Same goes with sibilance. Now, there are situations with digital music where it's not really made to be listened to in an analogue way, but then it is desired to be pressed on vinyl. And that's when you start to get into the weeds of this stuff and it becomes a bit difficult. Now, I would just say you need to have a production decision on this. If you've got crazy, blippy, glitchy noises and it's going to make, you know, a horrible noise or, the, you know, worse, it's going to make it jump. Or the cutting engineer is going to just have to lock all the, all the high frequency off to make a difference, you might want to, in the vinyl pre-mastering stage, say, look, there's going to be some compromises for the remaster for vinyl. We're aware of them. Let's focus on them. And there are all kinds of tricks you can do. You can do you know, high frequency limiting and then do a high frequency boost afterwards. 
So you still have the, the idea of that much high frequency energy, but those little moments in time are, uh, are dealt with. And again, most of the time, this stuff you kind of want to fix for the digitals anyway. But like I say, there are situations where you don't. I am not going to get into any more detail about processing audio for vinyl because, very simply, there's so many different stages. And like I said earlier, there's three different ways of approaching this. And it will determine how you go about this. But I hope that this avoids some stressy conversations and allows you to give some feedback and plan a bit. I mean, really, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to give you an opportunity to plan because if the professional process is good, you'll have people at every stage who know their roles, they know what they're trying to achieve, and you as the consumer, because you are paying people at the end of the day, um, can say, right, I want you to do this, this, and this. Uh, for the vinyl, we're thinking about this, this, this. Can you mock it up for me? What would it sound like? How, how this is the thing I do a lot, how short can make the size without it sounding weird um and then maybe we'll do a different version for the digital where there's a bit more of a breathing space but we'll just make it slight so nobody notices you know all this sort of stuff this could go in your first email to your mastering engineer it shouldn't be something that freaks you out when you get an email back from the plant saying oh we can't cut this or whatever and like i say in my other videos if any of this stuff freaks the mastering engineer out i would consider um questioning whether or not they're suitable for your project. Um, if somebody has experience with doing vinyl pre-mastering, which I do a lot of, some records here, these are, these are video game soundtracks um, which I've worked on for the record label Laced Records. These are all digital files. In every sense, every format you can imagine under the sun that have been given to me, and they've ended up on vinyl. People like the sound of them, and they spend lots of money on them. So it's possible but you do need a little bit of experience to be able to do this and you need a, um, the technical language as an engineer to be able to communicate with the plant. So yeah, thanks for watching, slightly longer one. Um, I'm hoping that this is useful. As always, you can contact me, um, contact at joekethnessmastering.com and uh, joekethnessmastering.com is the website. Any questions, send me an email, drop it in the comments, I'll reply to all of them. Um, so yeah. It's a difficult one, but hang in there and get a mastering engineer who knows the process and work with a plant or a broker that treats you fairly and, you know, can bridge any technical gaps in your knowledge. Thanks for watching.